perform um, director's life on a weekday. Uh, I've actually just, I think I've achieved a lot by convincing Dr. Malati to drive <laughs> over two hours uh, from Delhi on a weekday and spend time with us and that truly shows a passion for teaching and actually learning from younger cohorts. Uh, my direct interaction with Dr. Malati has been uh, more prominent since last uh, year. She was uh, the chief panelist of a major panel on plant varieties and food security at, uh, at Renmin University, organized by Singapore Management University School of Law and the Max Planck Institute in collaboration with General Global Law School. And she, of course, is an authority in the area of biotechnology in India. And uh, having been a co-panelist with her and been a rapporteur for her panel, I learned tremendously during my engagement. Uh, two brief e-meetings, and I sort of knew what could be a, a great point of comparison between India and China when it comes to that study. So I know that when she has promised you to give you one and a half hours of absolute uh, brilliance, uh, she really means business. <laughs> so um, I think you're very fortunate as, uh, and um, um, I count myself in to have her join us today to inaugurate uh, the conversation with an expert to mark the World IP Day celebrations. The Center for IP and Technology Law has been running a, a set of uh, seminar lectures to mark this day specifically based on the theme that the World Intellectual Property Organization poses, and we deliberate around contemporary concerns. Uh, so I'm, I'm very, very glad that Dr. Malti agreed to do the inaugural lecture way ahead on a weekday for us. So thank you, ma'am, and uh, most uh, welcome to the Global Law School as a lecturer more uh, than a chief panelist. I will briefly introduce uh, her bio to you and uh, the topic that she has chosen to speak on. And the format will be interactive, I'm said, so she will take on the lead, she will pose her uh, points of discussion through her PowerPoint, after which we will open the floor off to, for Q&A from your students. And she's aware that you are mostly students who have done an uh, undergraduate survey course in intellectual property law. So, she assumes that you do know the fundamentals of patent law as such, but she will probably urge you to think about the practical aspects of uh, patent commercialization when it comes to technology. And that's uh, her chosen uh, point of discussion today. She's speaking on innovations in the area of biotechnology and agriculture. Um, so um, I, I do know her bio is actually, I mean, in substance, more than two pages of absolute great work. But we managed to have it down for, say, like five or ten lines, and I'm going to read that for uh, introducing her to you. Dr. Malati has more than 30 years of experience in the field of biochemistry and molecular biology with an expertise in plant genomics, DNA fingerprinting, and genetic transformation. She has published more than 100 articles in various international and Indian journals. She serves as an executive director and heads the IP division of the reputed law firm, Lakshmi Kumar and Sridharan. As a registered patent agent, she is actively engaged in preparing, filing, and prosecuting of patent applications in India and abroad. Her main focus has been the pharmaceutical, chemical, and biotechnology patent applications. She also undertakes extensive work for startups and incubates in CCAMP and, and IIT Delhi, advising them on patent and freedom to operate opinions. She's the recipient of several awards, including the recognition for top women entrepreneur. Fogarty Visiting Research Associate from the National Institute of Health at United States, an individual expert in patent prosecution in the years 2016 and 2017 by IM Patent 1000. Um, Ma'am, I won't take uh, much time and I would invite you to kindly take the lecture. Uh, thank you, Sunita, and thanks, uh, General Global Law University, for inviting me to talk on innovations in the area of biotechnology and agriculture. Uh, I'm basically a scientist turned into this, you know, it had a late change in my career, but I'm very happy with it, and for reasons which I will discuss as I go along. Uh, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, I'm really going to talk on three subjects which are very, very different but it gives you a gamut of what's in biotechnology and agriculture. Uh, I'm going to start with something which is very, very latest, which is the CRISPR technology. Um, it's one of the latest, and uh, more that it has a lot of IP issues, the patent landscape, 
and how two universities are fighting over a technology which you might see very soon. Uh, I'm also going to talk about monoclonal antibodies because that's going to be the next type of pharmaceutical things that are going to be used and it's going to be so much. And then, uh, the last I would uh, genetically modified plants. I don't mind if you people ask questions in between and uh, I, I, it's fine with me. I mean, I'm, I'm used to that. So I'm going to start really, why is biotechnology so important? I actually started with, I'm sure because I'm talking more from the IP perspective than from the science perspective. It really started with the Diamond versus Chakravarti in 1980 with the Supreme Court. I'm sure all of you all have read it, right? And it really opened the floodgates for patents in the area of biotechnology. And even the biotechnology just started spreading at that time, and so it was a very important decision. And if we had a very different decision, I'm not sure how much of IP in biotechnology and agriculture would have really gone through. And so I think that was a landmark judgment. And really what happened after that is you had, how could you change uh, microorganisms? And so these are very good um, patterns by Kogan and Groom, uh, where they said you can actually modify or genetically modify microorganisms. So you can actually make insulin in um, E. coli, instead of killing animals. So that opened up and they had a lot of licensing things and a lot of companies did start Genentech and Amgens and everything started on this biotech field. And then uh, you had the next round, which is from Columbia University and other universities, where they said, why, why only stop with modifying uh, uh, microorganisms? Can we modify higher forms of uh, life? could be plants, could be animals, and so on. And then that started the whole thing of trying to modify uh, higher forms of life, which I call plants and animals. And then, of course, you all have seen Dolly, how you can actually clone animals, which you never thought before that it could happen. You always wanted um, you know, fertilization and how. But actually, you can take adult cells and produce a whole organism. And not in microbes, but in, um, in animals. And so that, again, was very controversial, ethical things. But that's where they are. And we also saw last week a report from China where they have cloned two monkeys. Because it was actually done with Dolly, the sheep. And they've really done it with monkeys. And that was very difficult primates was difficult to do this cloning. And so if you can do monkeys, you can actually clone humans now. And uh, the China is very, very way ahead, both in CRISPR and in other technologies. So what really happened? And then came CRISPR. Uh, so I'm going to really get is CRISPR is nothing but you know gene editing. I'm going to talk about this because I'm sure you're going to hear CRISPR a lot. It's going to be really the in thing that's happening. Again, China is way ahead of India. I mean, nobody talks about it, nobody does it, but uh, they're just way ahead of this technology as compared to India. I'm not comparing it with the United States. Uh, and what really is this technology? And I'm, of course, going to um, uh, integrate it with the IP. It's just not a science talk that I'm going to talk. It's actually going to integrate it with the uh, IP landscape in uh, the CRISPR-Cas9 system. I thought I'll start that. It's a very hot topic. It's an important topic. And I'm sure you're going to listen about this. So I thought, let me start it with this. Uh, so what is, um, so I just told you about genetic engineering. You can actually modify plants, modify uh, eukaryotes, prokaryotes, and so on. And it actually means I can insert a gene, I can delete a gene, I can replace a gene. And this is all by the great technology called CRISPR which uses an enzyme called nucleases, which are called molecular scissors. I can actually disrupt the gene. I can add something into it. I can delete it. I can do anything that I want. And it's a very useful, easy technique, I think, that can actually done, be done by college students and school students. It's that easy. So basically, it's like your Microsoft Word that you have, cut, paste, right? I cut it from somewhere. I copy it, and I can paste it. It's as simple as that. So what are we going to do? 
It can do it in a whole lot of systems like um, bacteria, you can do it in mouse, you can do it in plants, you can do it in anything, and you can make designer babies out of that, okay? So I'm going to, that's the, that's the power of this uh, whole technology, and it's very easy. It's not like Dolly trying to clone, it's not. It's much, much easier. So let me tell you, we all are experiencing CRISPR every day. Do you know any ideas where we are experiencing CRISPR? Anybody has ideas? Yes? In plant? Modified plants? No, that's a different technology. Kentucky Fried Chicken is one more. Oh, no, 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 I'm not. Vaccinations. Yes. Vaccinations, yeah. Anything else? Any idea? It's yogurt. Yogurt. As simple as yogurt, right? And if I tell CRISPR is in yogurt, and everybody wants to stand up, because I'm not talking about Dolly and Kentucky Fried Chicken, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about daily that you eat the yi, correct? Every time you eat yogurt, you're eating CRISPR, okay? Uh, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by CRISPR? So CRISPR was actually identified in 2004, but the whole patent landscape came up in 2012. So what do I mean that, that yogurt or dahi has CRISPR? What do I mean by that? So I'll just explain that before I go on to this technology. Um, we have immune system, right? So we've all been vaccinated by polio, by smallpox, by a whole lot of vaccinations that we have undergone. And what happens is during vaccination, one of these antigens or proteins is pumped into you, and then the body says, this is a foreign material, and it will produce an immune system antibodies to target it. And the next time you have this virus or bacteria coming into you, the body says, hey, look, I know about this very well. So let's say that is polio. If you've been vaccinated by polio, the first time you'll get a reaction, it's a mild reaction, and, but the next time you get the polio infection, the body is all there, the immune system is all ready to fight that infection and throw it out, correct? This is called as an immune system, which is very well known. And that is why we start, we get immunized, not only through vaccination, but we also get immunized by having a whole lot of other things like, you know, infections, cold, and so on and so forth. So that's how we get immune system. But what happens in bacteria? Bacteria doesn't have immune system. They don't have macrophages. They don't have the bone marrow to do your immune systems, which is only in the complicated in animals, it doesn't have in plants as well. So bacteria then said, how do I get, how do I immunize myself against something which is going to invade me, a pathogen which is going to invade me, right? So what happens in yogurt? You have a bacteria called as lactobacilli. The minute you take the, uh, the milk and you put the lactobacilli, it then converts lactose to lactic acid. It does a whole lot of things and you actually get your yogurt, right? This is so simple. So why do I say that we have CRISPR? So CRISPR is nothing like an immune system because every time you put lactobacilli, there are many pathogens like viruses which would like to kill the lactobacilli. That's how the system works. So there are many pathogens like um, bacteriophages, viruses, which will go and attack this lactobacilli and try to kill the lactobacilli. So what happens in these huge fermenters that they have, sometimes the heat doesn't work well, right? And some days it works very well. It's because of this bacteria, uh, because of these viruses and bacteriophages, which actually stop this um, lactobacilli from, from growing and producing the yogurt, right? So how does uh, lactobacilli, or I would say microorganism, able to counter viruses. Okay, viruses are something which will hit onto the bacteria and not allow the bacteria to grow. They're called as bacteriophages, they're called as viruses. So what happens is every time a virus comes and affects either you, me, plants, or bacteria, a copy of it becomes resident within the host. 
may not be the whole. It could be a small amount. It could be 10 base pairs. It could be 20 base pairs because the viruses cannot multiply on their own. So they use the whole system to multiply. And they have to bring in their uh, viral DNA into the host DNA. And it actually cheats on the host DNA. The host DNA thinks it's part of its own DNA, produces the virus. The virus will then multiply and kill the cell later and then again go and affect and infect other cells, correct? So simple, viruses cannot grow on their own, use the host system to produce this. So now the bacteria has to counter this virus. So every time the virus affects, a small part of the viral DNA becomes part of the host DNA. Every time. Every time that happens, so this becomes like your immune system. So when this small amount of viral DNA stays in this lactobacilli, the next time the virus affects it, that attacks it, this resident viral DNA will say, oh, look, now I will start the CRISPR. CRISPR is a clustered, um, interspaced, uh, short palindromic sequence. Don't worry what it is. I'll explain that. The small little uh, viral DNA that is there in the host genome there is this nucleus is called as Cas9 or nucleases. And the minute they see, oh, we have this in our system, this is a foreign bacteria, foreign material coming into us, and it will cut the virus into pieces. So this whole technology of CRISPR was there in bacteria, was already a resident of bacteria in the form of um, these palindromic sequences and an enzyme called as Cas9. And so the Cas9 would cut these um, uh, viruses in a way. But if a new virus comes in, the bacteria is lost. It doesn't know what to do. So then the first time it will have a resident bacteria. Some of it might escape. Some of it will say, OK, I've gotten through. And then the next time the same virus attacks, the bacteria knows how to do it. So CRISPR is nothing else but a resident technology in bacteria <coughs> to get rid of pathogens like viruses. So now, what is all this about? OK, so what? Viruses had, bacteria had the system. And so now they found, oh, this is a very good system to insert and delete and replace whatever genes you want. So people use this technology, which is the immune technology in bacteria, to actually take it to higher life forms. Clear? So this is the whole CRISPR technology that I have. So you can have the target gene which is actually your viral gene. You can disrupt it. You can uh, delete it. You can replace it. And that is what I do. So you need to cut it and then have a disruption or cut it and insert. And that is the whole thing of CRISPR. OK? So, so how did they identify this? They found that this SG RNA that I have there, correct, the first one, is known as a guide RNA, and it is actually a part of the virus DNA, which infected it generations before. And it is this little guide RNA which detects all the future attacks, but with the help of a scissors, which is your Cas9 nucleus, the Cas9 will find these breaks and break it. And that is how you form a complex of this um, guide RNA along with this um, Cas9, and so you can induce mutations in the gene sequences. So CRISPR is nothing but clustered regulatory interspace short palindromic reports along with Cas, where you can delete, insert, or disrupt a gene. So how is it useful? As I said, I told you in bacteria, it is very useful to get rid of viruses. And so what do companies do? They have these huge fermenters to make yogurt, and if they lose that batch of bacteria, they're gone, right? So they identify those type of lactobacillus, which has different types of viruses already resident in them. So they'll take the bacteria and attack it with as many viruses and say, can it survive? If it survives, it's good to make it for yogurt. If it cannot, then it will try and try to identify more bacteria, which has many, many copies of the viral DNA. Uh, this system of viral DNA 
The CRISPR-Cas9 doesn't exist in humans, okay, and in higher forms. It only exists in the lower forms, which is bacteria and others. But how are we going to use this technology that they identified in bacteria to do it into humans, do it into plants? So there's a very simple thing that everybody knows called a sickle cell anemia. It's just one nucleotide which is different and because of that, the amino acid is different. Because of that, they get sickle cell anemia. The hemoglobin is not formed properly, and they cannot absorb oxygen, right? So it's a very, very small thing. CRISPR-Cas9 has the ability to change the single cell, uh, sickle cell anemia. And the first technology that you're going to see when I say designer babies or say designer humans is actually going to be blood. So I can actually take out my blood from the, either from the bone marrow or from my blood, change the sickle cell anemia. If I have sickle cell anemia, make these small things using this Cas9, change the cells and put it back in. And so now I have better cells. I have cells which don't have sickle cell anemia. So it's as simple as that to change one nucleotide. And the first type of technology that you're going to see is going to be where I can change the blood. It's easy because I will keep rotating, I can keep doing it instead of trying to do it in heart tissues, like change, trying to change my liver, <laughs> trying to change the brain, trying to change a pancreas. It's maybe difficult, but right now it's going to start with the blood. And uh, you've, they've shown in um, mouse, I think I have some. Uh, so before I go into mouse, so this is what his CRISPR is relevant. Bacterial genomes have 40% of CRISPR. CRISPR is nothing but a resident viral DNA. And in archaebacteria, it's 90% of its genome is made up of virus. And how, many, how much of our genome is made up of viruses? Does anybody know? Anybody guess? We have viral DNA within us, OK? How many? No idea? 30% or more. 30% of any of your genome, take any cell and look at it, 30% or more is viral DNA. And I have time, I'll explain other things of what this viral DNA does in our thing. So we are all really transgenic, okay? So if somebody comes and says, oh, don't touch transgenic plant, every time a white fly sits on a plant, it injects its viral DNA. The viral DNA copy goes and sits into the plant and it goes into the next generation. So when people say, no, no, we are not eating. So let's say viruses are, because they cannot multiply, they will insert themselves into the host cell and the resident stays back, right? Uh, uh, and so uh, when I said that, how do I actually change this? So this is the guide RNA which you have as a YouTube, like you-like thing, not that YouTube, which is, which is like a U there, it's called the guide RNA. It will try to find its resident, it will cut it, and then I can insert and I can do. So this is nothing else but something that is resident in, um, in a bacterial system. And we are now trying to put this whole Cas9, everything into the human system or the plant system. It's very easy to do it. Uh, uh, so this is very much like what happens every time the bacteria, every time that's the top, on the top that you see a hexagonal thing, that's the virus, the viral DNA goes in. This is the Cas9, which is the enzyme. It will cut it, but next time the viral DNA comes in, that's the first attack. The next time the viral DNA comes in, the bacteria knows, okay, this is a foreign DNA. I have the CRISPR, I have Cas9, and I will cut it. Um, so this is how it looks like. You can, you can add any DNA. So I wanted to tell how do people do it in mouse. So people are only starting it with where I can change a single gene, like sickle cell anemia. It's one nucleotide change, and it can be done. Uh, then let's take cystic fibrosis, which I know is a single gene, which is responsible for cystic fibrosis. I can start working on that. So everything which is a single gene, where I only need to modify it or change it, that can be done. But if there are multiple genes and complex things, it may be difficult. 
So what did they do in mice? What they did is color of the mice skin is a single gene. It can be black or it can be white. And they knocked off this gene of the black color and you can actually get white mice or pink mice, correct? And these are called as nude mice or something which doesn't have the color. So a single gene can be disrupted, a single gene can be inserted, a single gene can be replaced or um, deleted insertions and so on. And this is the system, I don't want to go too much into science because this is a little too science heavy. Uh, so people have done it in mice, have shown that you can actually change the skin color. Uh, the eye color is again a single gene and it was a mutation and that's why you have this blue color eyes and so you can actually make designer babies with blue eyes if you want. And the technology is there. The Chinese have already done it. So how do you do it? You take the fetus, you take the, um, you know, you make the fertilization between the egg and the sperm and then you say I want blue eyes. Uh, you can actually insert the gene. It's much easier in a mammalian system. You actually take an injection, you take a needle, a syringe, and you can actually insert it. Uh, there are ethical, so people who actually first found this technology are uh, by two groups. Main group was Jennifer Daudana and uh, Emmanuel Charpentier. They found out the system, but now there are many, many uh, groups working on it. And so you can actually, Chinese have actually done it. Uh, however, the, uh, the um, US and um, Europe has actually put a moratorium on not trying to use this technology because you really don't know where it will go and how it will happen. So it's such a technology that you can actually do it. Plants may be slightly tougher because it's difficult to insert a gene into a plant. It's very easy to insert a gene into human systems, animal systems, and so on. Um, so crops uh, successfully uh, have been edited with CRISPR, and you will never know that you have a GMO, OK? Because there is nothing resident that is going to be there. You're actually going to take the gene, like a single cell, sickle cell anemia, and actually going to change it so people will never be able to identify whether this is genetically modified or not. So that is where the technology is, because the technology doesn't need anything. So people are doing it, food and livestock modifications. There's gene drives, gene therapy, human germ line, and you can actually make uh, designer organisms and more. Uh, this can actually be done. It is not any more science fiction. It can actually be done any, any time and any and the Chinese have gone way ahead. So where are the two groups that are actually working? The one in University of California at Berkeley by Jennifer Daudana and um, Emmanuel Charpentier. She's from University of Vienna, but Berkeley, University of Berkeley, Jennifer Daudana and Emmanuel Charpentier actually worked together. And in 2012, they've been working for quite some time. Actually, as I said, this thing about Yogurt having CRISPR was well known, Danisco was working on it, but they didn't know that this technology could be used in other systems. They knew that this is there like an immune system for yogurt, that is for lactobacilli. They knew that, and people had sequenced it, found out there are many viral DNA copies in lactobacilli. But Jennifer Daudana and um, um, Emmanuel Charpentier realized it and said, oh, we can, you can use it to you can use it to modify, delete, replace, and insert whatever you want. And that's when the power, it's actually a 2004 uh, publication where they can do. But why do I say it's such a complex? So it, this is all done by university, not in the um, private sector. So University of Berkeley and Jennifer, Jennifer Daudana and Emmanuel Charpentier worked on this technology and they filed their patent in 2012, maybe May, May, June uh, 2012, May, I think so. Uh, side by side, you had uh, Broad University along with MIT Harvard, which came up with their own technology, very similar to that of uh, Jennifer Daudana. 
and uh, also file their patents. And so you have two groups which are actually fighting with one another on the IP uh, scene, which is Broad Institute, MIT, Harvard on one side. And then you have Berkeley and uh, uh, University of California at Berkeley and University of Vienna working together uh, on one side. Uh, so this whole thing came up. And now you see that the licensing of these technologies. So both of them did file. A broad filed in December 2012. Uh, the Berkeley Institute, uh, Berkeley Group did it about five, six months before. But Broad Institute has a patent, whereas Berkeley doesn't have. Because Broad Institute went and said uh, by, um, you know, they wanted expedited examination, and they went and got their patents there. Now, where do I say that it all this? They all have surrogate companies, like Berkeley has Caribou. Uh, they also have a CRISPR Technologies things. Uh, Broad and others have another company called Editas. And these are surrogate companies run by these, um, uh, run by these um, uh, academicians, or I would say professors, who are then licensing these technologies. And so will people really, at this point, do not know whom they should take these technologies? Whom should they license these technologies from? Should they go to Berkeley? Should they go to Broad? Who has what technologies? But when this, um, uh, so what happened is when Broad got its uh, patent granted, Berkeley filed an interference uh, proceedings against uh, Broad, saying we were the first. And uh, so their claims read on our claims. We were earlier people. We were earlier filers. Um, before the pre-AIA, and therefore, according to this interference proceedings, it should be Berkeley which should get all the patent rights and not broad. Uh, but what the interference proceedings that happened in USPTO came up with, they said, no, 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 look, broad is doing it for eukaryotes, mm -hmm. and yours is for prokaryotes, and this, you did not give examples on how it is being used in eukaryotes, and therefore, I'm sorry. Uh, therefore, they said that, um, so in the interference proceedings, uh, they came up, USPTO came up and said, no, no, broad is for eukaryotes, yours is maybe, you've done it in prokaryotes, so it is um, bacteria and others, and there isn't any common overlap between the two claims or the technologies, and therefore broad patent is valid. Uh, they have, Berkeley has challenged this. In the meanwhile, uh, Berkeley is fighting all these cases, but if you see, it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, the licensing technology. The first half is with Broad, the lower half, as you see, is with um, Berkeley, and there are a couple of them which have gone to both, and people are absolutely confused now, whom do you take your um, license from? And uh, so they're trying to form, so just like you have the friend and others, they're trying to form a pool. So when you have a pool of all these important patterns in a pool, then people could come and actually take the license and go. But the thing is that you have non-exclusive license, so will the uh, private companies actually come for such licensing where people, put, let's say two groups want to work on sickle cell anemia, who would get the right to it? Who would have the monopoly over it? And so this is quite um, a scene where people are really confused now. And with this uh, broad technology saying that theirs is in eukaryotes and Berkeley is for prokaryotes, so there is a little issue over here. Uh, further on, if you look at this, um, I'm going to come to the what's happened in Europe. So we've got diametrically opposite decisions, broad versus Berkeley in the US versus that in, the, um, in Europe. I'm just going to come to that in a minute. Uh, if you see the world leaders are definitely US. You have all these yellow that is there is mainly US. But China is picking up. Uh, India, we are nowhere. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, that's where we are. We are nowhere. Uh, China is really picking up. And as I said, they don't have so many ethical issues. Uh, the regulators are not very tough there. And therefore, China can actually use this technology in any system that they want. 
whereas Europe and US are a little careful about how they would use this technology. Um, so mainly it is US, as you see, but there is also China, then comes EPO, UK. So this is very, very US-focused technologies, especially the first technologies which came. But actually, if you see, a lot of it really did start in Europe. As I said, in 2004, people started doing it. 2008, you had five patents. But it really picked up after 2012, after Jennifer Daudana and Zhang of uh, Broad really started filing these patents. Uh, right now, about 450 patent applications have, patents have been granted in the USPTO. People are doing it with different technologies, academic research, and people are trying to do. So there's a huge amount of global filings. Uh, US is really in the strong position, uh, but it's getting weaker because China is getting stronger. There's a diversity of in, uh, institutions, and they have actually said that you can use these technologies for research, but you cannot use it for commercial commercialization. So we are right now looking at it, and Europe is also going that way. So this is what, in short, I've already explained a lot of this, but I'm really going to tell what's the difference, why this big difference, how it started, where they are. I'm just going to, it's, it's a little complicated, but what I really want to say is, as I said, broad patent, the patent for broad, not broad patent, the patent for broad, the inventor Zhang, uh, his patent was granted in your in US, uh, and uh, they said there's no interference with uh, Jennifer Daudana, but she feels she's the first one who actually came up with this technology. Uh, but what has happened in Europe? You've got the exact opposite result. Oh, sorry. You've got the exact opposite result in um, in Europe. Uh, UC Berkeley receives the CRISPR patent in Europe. Okay. And EPO revokes the broad CRISPR patent. So you have the exact diametrically opposite where the broad patent was um, um, valid in US and it has been invalidated in, uh, in Europe. Whereas Berkeley did not receive their US patent, but they have received their CRISPR patent in Europe. So you've got diametrically opposite. And what is it? Why did EPO revoke Broad's patent? When in US they found it's a good technology, there isn't any problem with that technology, they're working for eukaryotes, then why would you revoke it in Europe? And it's only over a procedural issue. So they had several, um, they had several provisional patents that they filed in, uh, in US, and in one of them they did not put one of their um, inventor's name because it was based on the claims. So in the PCT application, one of the inventor's name was left out, not for any reason, but because he did not, his work did not have a claim for it. And therefore, Broad said, that person's name is in the provisional application from which you have taken priority, but that the name is not there in the <coughs> final, and therefore, he, we do not allow this application or the priority application of that. Now, when that priority application was disallowed, there was an intervening prior art mm -hmm. because they allowed, they just disallowed that um, this thing. There was an intervening uh, prior art, and that intervening prior art was the one which was responsible for um, for this uh, intervening art. And because of the intervening art, which this um, um, inventor had uh, published, because of that, they lost their CRISPR patent in Broad. Now, Broad has also filed an appeal, and therefore you see completely different um, uh, scenes happening in University of Berkeley and uh, uh, the Broad, that is MIT. Uh, so this is as far as um, CRISPR patent is um, concerned. If you'll have any questions, otherwise I'll go to the next topic uh, of my talk. Any questions now? Uh, I yeah. just wanted a, a brief yeah. clarification because this really helps. I'm, I've been trying to follow the interference proceedings of the United yeah. States, but not so clearly for the EU, EU. What's interesting though, the United States has been viewing this entire technology from an innovator's point of view. Yeah. That, you know, scientific innovation needs to be fostered and uh, it's, uh, so in that sense, Broad has been encouraged to that extent. 
uh, also it is only broad and their group of scientists who have come come forward with the idea of pooling this you don't see the same kind of approach from the uh, berkeley school and that's my <coughs> question more as in is is that kind of behavior of say academics and say even uh, other companies that influences the decision that yes this patent would actually lead to some kind of better innovative technology and use rather than actually having one person exclusively driving the show like we've seen in my area or otherwise mm. that was the public interest claim that mm. should we give a research to yeah. uh, a patent to one corporation mm -hmm. now in this case of course the it's more like who ran first to file it and mm. who got it first, but eventually they they do read onto each other. So that's mm. why it, it is technical to decide interference would invalidate the claim. But this activity of pooling and actually allowing and bifurcating your license practice as being okay, one kind of research only license and the other kind of uh, for private or company commercial is mm. that. Yeah, so th this is actually, it's, it gets even more um, difficult when you look at the licensing scene. As I told you earlier on, they are coming up with these pooled, um, yeah, they're coming up with a pool and uh, Broad has given everything. Uh, Berkeley is yet to give, but the whole lot of them have pooled. And I think going forward, there may be a reconciliation between the grooms, and I think going forward, it's going to be more pooling. And uh, the pooling is the one because it's pretty, pretty, um, it's not like a one single patent and you license it. It's a lot of patents, a lot of technologies, and even if these people, Berkeley and others, have the technology, a lot of the genes and a lot of the other technologies could be somebody else because you'll take single, single cell, or you'll take insulin gene, or you'll do something like that, right? And so let's look at it if there is certain technology like cystic fibrosis. Uh, these groups cannot work on their own because they don't work on cystic fibrosis. The technology is there. So they have to encourage lots of groups to work on these technologies like cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, and so on, which are single gene uh, type of uh, problems or issues that you have. And so going forward, uh, definitely the way I look at it, it is going to be more pooling. Mm -hmm. They come together and they will work. So there are some companies who have taken licenses from both groups. Mm -hmm. And there are some companies who are only with one group. But going forward, the pooling is what it is going to really happen. And so as far as US is concerned, they're very clear that uh, Broad is for eukaryotes. That's what he restricted its claims to eukaryotes. Uh, Berkeley is for prokaryotes, and therefore they didn't see that this technology. But what you see in Europe is more a procedural issue. Why did you leave this um, inventor's name out? And because you left his name out, that um, priority went, the minute that priority went, there was an intervening art. So uh, more, they didn't say anything about the technology, but you must realize that every country, every jurisdiction has their own patent law. Mm -hmm. And we have to be aware about that. And I think you just cannot say, oh, I follow the US way or I follow the European way. Mm -hmm. And it was more on a procedural issue that it got revoked or invalidated in Europe. But, you know, I No, 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 because it's, it's, uh, I didn't go too much into the technology. And when Jennifer Daunana and others did it, they could show it. People know that this worked in lactobacilli. The people knew it worked in prokaryotes. People knew it. So Jennifer Daunana knew it. But she was the first one to show that this technology can be actually used to replace, disrupt, uh, insert any issue, right? That is what she showed. But she did not have... She did not show how it can be used in eukaryotes. Okay. 
and uh, broad, you have to make changes because uh, the human system and this don't have this CRISPR Cas9. Mm -hmm. And so they had to do this. So the next technologies that is going on is not necessarily with Cas9 because these groups have the technology for Cas9, but there are several other Cas. So um, they're called as CasX and CasY and Cas13A and whole lot of enzymes and nucleases people are working on. I'm now going to, um, um, what are the challenges that we have in India? And I'm really going to do is our uh, section three of the Indian Patent Act. And I'm really going to talk about biotechnology and agriculture. And so we have, uh, so uh, patents is granted for novelty, inventor step, and capable of industrial application. Everybody knows that. And that's what is, is there everywhere. Uh, however, you do see that there are section three of the Indian Patents Act uh, says that certain technologies are not patentable subject matter. And so if you look at section three B, it says contrary to public order and morality. So anything like you're doing like Dolly, or you want to uh, clone um, uh, you know, animals, then under public order and morality, you will have a problem. Anything that you want to destroy the environment or do something that is harm to the environment, can be come, come under Section 3B. So anybody who's using an embryo to come up with stem cell technologies, Government of India will say, no, 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 you're destroying the embryo and then coming up with cells, correct? So destruction of embryos is not allowed. And WARF case is a very famous case in WARF, which is Wisconsin Alumina Research Foundation, where they used embryos, but they had used it much before and they come up with stem cell technologies. So in Government of India under Section 3B can say that I will not allow that. Um, so 3C, I'm going to do some of these. 3D3, I won't do today, but I might work uh, talk on 3J. So cloning of human beings, modifying uh, human germ lines, modifying embryos, using embryos, or even using plants where you genetically modify the plants and it's adversely affecting the environment, or use of human embryos for commercial. All these, there's only some examples I've given of where the government of India under the, uh, or the IPO can come up with and say, sorry, we don't allow these type of patterns under contrary to public order and morality. Okay, so this is one set I don't want to go. But the more important thing that I want to talk is discovery. Uh, this is very big thing for us in uh, biotechnology and agriculture. What is discovery? Because discovery cannot be patented. So mere discovery of a known substance, either living or non-living, cannot be patented, correct? So somebody discovers Pluto, you cannot, it's a discovery, it was there, and you cannot get for that. So what do I mean by discovery? So this question of discovery. So in India, the mere discovery of a living or a non-living substance is not patentable. So all isolated DNA sequence, proteins, microorganism that I picked up, let's say I pick up a nice uh, microorganism like lactobacilli and use it for yogurt production, that will not be patentable because it's already there in the environment. All you did was to isolate it. So all these isolated DNA protein microorganisms are not patentable under Section 3C. And the whole thing really came about, India was raising some issues but not so clear, but the whole thing actually precipitated because of the myriad judgment. And what do I mean by the myriad judgment? That was for the BRCA genes. And so some people have the BRCA gene, which is a breast cancer gene, BRCA1, BRCA2. So some people have the mutated gene and some people have the normal gene. So this is a company called Myriad who identified these BRCA genes, which were mutated genes. They took the akinesi genes and they looked at the population. Some of them were getting uh, breast cancer generation after generation and some families didn't get it. So they did a whole lot of um, uh, experiments to identify the genes, which is called as a BRCA1 or the BRCA2 genes. And uh, so the whole thing was like what uh, Sunita said was, is it a more a public interest thing? And uh, in the United States, most countries are allowing um, DNA to um, genes which are known. And why all of a sudden? So this is the reason is that 
Every time Myriad would do these experiments and they would, if you gave your DNA or you gave your blood sample, they would uh, run these um, experiments or assays to see whether you have normal gene or you have abnormal gene, that is mutated gene. And if you have a mutated gene, the chances of you getting uh, cancer is very high. Uh, therefore, this is a very good technique because it is, do I have diabetes? I give my blood, correct? Do I have, can I get breast cancer? I give my blood. So the question then came up is that they were charging a lot of money and people said that, um, is it ethical? Because what have you identified? You've only identified some people who had mutated genes, some people who had normal gene, and you identified the mutated genes, right? And therefore, it is discovery. The mutated genes were already there. All you did was to isolate and give it a function. But in, in biotechnology, most of these things happen like that. Most of these are discovery. Uh, but the Supreme Court in the United States, no. They said BRCA genes trying to um, get a intellectual property protection for something that you don't own. And you didn't. You only discovered it. It was there. And you discovered it. So here there are some issues because the gene or the BRCA gene as such is not floating around. It's in the whole chromosome, and it takes a lot of time to actually identify and check what it is. It's not like Pluto, which is, you know, or a, or a star, which is going there. So that was the thing. So where did Europe do? Europe said, no, it is not. What you're looking at is information, right? So can I clone the insulin gene? Because the insulin gene is not free-floating that you can discover it, correct? And um, so they said that it is part of a whole chromosome, and I identified that. The information, the information of the DNA information or the protein information may be same. So in Europe, they said anybody who isolates a DNA or a protein or a molecule from a living system or a non-living system, and you give it a technical effect, it becomes uh, invention. So there's a very thin line which actually divides discovery and invention, correct? So they said, if I isolate insulin, or I isolate relaxin, or I isolate growth hormone from humans, and I can show a function, like a BRCA gene, then it is not discovery. Because these are not freely floating, you know, you just do it. You have to actually isolate it, find out its function, find out its this. They also had a lot of cases on public order and morality on whether you have public order and morality to isolate such genes and give it a function. And so Europe was very clear. The minute you isolate a DNA or a protein from a system, from the environment, that was a word, from the environment, and give it a function, then it becomes a patentable invention. Mm -hmm. But if you don't and you leave it, it remains as, an in, as a discovery. So I'll just give you some examples to make it a little easier is let's say I have the gum tree, right? All of you have seen a gum tree, and the gum is leaks out, correct? So the gum that leaks out, or I cut a rubber tree, and I cut a uh, insertion, and I collect it, that becomes a rubber liquid, correct? So that is not, that is discovery, because I didn't do anything. I did not isolate a rubber material from thousands of other molecules and say this is rubber. Nor did I say out of thousands of molecules that this is gum. But if I isolate azadirectin from neem, let's say neem has thousands of molecules, and azadirectin is not coming out. It is part of the leaf, it is part of the system. I have to actually crush it. I have thousands of molecules. I have to identify that molecule, which is azadirectin, and show it a technical effect. Without a technical effect, you cannot get a patent, correct? So the Europe was very clear that if you isolate a molecule from the environment and give it a technical effect, it is an invention and not a discovery. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't have to isolate, like taking out gum, then it is not an um, invention. It is a discovery. So if as a directant came as powder on top of the leaf and you have to just dust it, then that becomes a discovery. But if out of thousands of molecules I have to isolate as a direction and show it's got pesticidal, then it becomes an invention. Uh, and they said because it's not exactly like that in the system, in the system it's mixed up with so many other things, and you can not show that it is discovery. So Europe also had these problems, but they said very clearly. But in U United States with the Supreme Court, I think they got confused with 
information versus a molecule. You get a patent for a molecule. You do not get a patent for an information. So the BRCA gene is an information is exactly like that, but the molecule is different. The molecule can be bits and pieces, and it is not what it is like that in the system. But anyway, Australia, Canada, everybody is going in this way. And Indian patent office, oh, they read parts of Myriad, and they said, OK, DNA sequences will not be patentable. However, cDNA, which is not there within the system, and you do it in the lab, that is patentable subject matter, but not the genes and this. Uh, what I want to do, giving this background, I'm just going to give some examples that we have on uh, monoclonal antibodies. The reason I'm talking about monoclonal antibodies because the next level of uh, drugs are going to come with these big molecules, which I call as monoclonal antibodies. And so if you look at it, there was a rejection of one of these um, antibody molecules by GITR. Uh, the patent office uh, just said, no, no, it's a discovery because everybody produces antibody. You put an antigen, you put an epitope, some protein, you're going to get an immune response, and all you've done is to isolate it. So if you look at it, the pink one that I've shown, or the purple one that I've shown is from mouse, the yellow one is from humans, and what they actually did was to uh, make a chimeric molecule where the, the purple part, which is actually the one which actually works as an antibody, came from murine or mouse system, and the remaining is from humans. The reason we keep holding human is we don't want reaction against mouse protein. So you want to keep as much of it as human as possible because human to human, we will not have interaction. But if I put a mouse protein into my system, my system is going to throw it out, correct? So they wanted to keep as little of the mouse as possible and keep remaining of it as, um, as the protein. Uh, but the patent office said nothing doing, I'm not going to give this patent. Because you've taken this part, the first part, which is your variable part from mouse, you've taken the, uh, the constant region from humans, and all you've done is to merge it. It's not as easy as that, but it looks like it's easy, and they said no. Because when they drafted their application, they said the first to 20 amino acids is murine. 20 to 80 is humans, they said that. And they said, look, you yourself have said that it is this. But when you look at a claim, you read the claim as a whole. And the claim as a whole has both the constant region and the variable region. And so in nature, you never identified an antibody, which is a mixture, like I've shown pink and yellow, that is called the chimeric one, which is on the left-hand side for you. And you had a pink, which is from urine, the yellow from the human. And a, a, a chimeric antibody never existed in nature. And therefore, it cannot fall under discovery. But our patent office says, no, 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 this part is, um, uh, is from urine, this is from humans, and so all you did was to merge. And so the reason is we don't have the IPAB, which is not functional, and therefore there are no case laws to actually say that this is in, in, uh, incorrect interpretation. But we have to live with this. And when you have humanized antibodies, we are going to have problems. And the question is, can chimeric antibodies fall under discovery? So the question is, most of our patent office examiners and controllers are not legally trained. Mm. And they don't have this legal knowledge of how you interpret a claim. So they're more like a scientist. And it is very difficult. As a science, I say, so what? I have to take it from here. I have to take it from there. I join it, and I can get it. So as a science, it looks very easy, but you have to look at it from the legal point of view. And that is where we feel it is missing in the Indian Patent Office. Uh, but they learn, they will do. So we have one more case like that, which is from Zymogenetics, again, uh, IL-21 antagonist. Again, this is a chimeric antibody. Again, it was um, rejected by the Patent Office, saying that it is a discovery. Actually, it's not, because what molecule I actually sell in the market has, is not there in anywhere else in the world. It's created in the lab, and therefore it cannot fall under discovery. But we do have a lot of these issues that we have another case, that is IL-21 antagonist, uh, where they are not giving you the patent because of um, discovery. So discovery, we have a lot of issues, microorganisms and um, uh, other uh, areas as well that we have problems of discovery. I'm just going to come and show you what discovery problems 
we could face in agriculture. And so I want to talk about the next part is about 3J of the ad. I'm not doing 3D and 3E because it's more pharma yeah. and it is a new form of a known substance and I think you'll have heard a lot of it must be. <laughs> and so I don't want to do that. Um, in, uh, in 3J, plants and animals in whole or any part thereof other than microorganisms, but including seeds, variety species is not patentable and Essentially, biological process for production of plants and animals is also not patentable. So plants and animals in whole or part thereof is not. And so the way the patent office is reading is cells are also not patentable because cell, a plant cell is part of a plant. Uh, but crossing and selfing, they say, are conventional breeding and therefore not patentable. So let's look at this scenario that we have. Uh, just a minute. Yeah. Uh, so what are we, what is the issue that we are facing now? And I'm really going to talk about the Bolgard 2 cotton, which is BT cotton that we have in India. And what are the challenges that we are having with respect to the uh, uh, Indian Patents Act? And so one of the issues becomes discovery, correct? Not only that, when I isolate a gene, like a BT gene from bacteria, and I put it into plant. So the gene is there in the bacteria, and I'm putting it into a plant, and therefore, this becomes discovery. So the gene per se, the promoter to drive the expression per se, are all not patentable subject matter because they are discovery. However, if I look at this uh, thing of purple, green, mustard, and yellow, right? That's the construct. The construct is I have a gene to drive the expression, I have a promoter, and then I can have something else, an on, off switch, which can be like an enhancer or a promoter like thing and then I can have other things. So I made a construct, and such a construct doesn't exist in nature. So I claim for a construct which is made up of promoter, genes, terminator, and so on, and this construct is not present in nature, and therefore it does not fall under discovery. So when you make a construct, which you take from different pieces from different organisms, put it together and say I'm using a construct, we never get discovery problem, right? So what we saw problem in antibody, where again they mix and match, the controller says it is a discovery. We also hear mix and match with a promoter and this, but here he says, no, it's not discovery. You've taken it from different regions and this construct as such is not available in nature. And therefore this construct which I have, this purple, green, orange and everything, put together that construct is not there in nature because you've created in the lab. And therefore, the patent office here is very, very clear. They never give you discovery problems. Mm -hmm. Because they say, if I claim for a gene, I may get. If I claim for a promoter, I may get. But when I claim for a construct, which has all these different parts together or components together, then I never get a discovery problem. Sometimes they will, but if you give a right answer, they readily take back those objections. So here we are, same patent office, same controller, in antibody, we'll say it's a discovery, and in a plant, we'll say it is not discovery. Even in antibody cases, some controllers are very clear that such a molecule never existed and will not give. So it's very, very dependent on controller to controller and their understanding of discovery. Uh, so this construct, as I said, is very important because I use this construct, which is a Bolgard 2 gene, which is, so Bolgard 1 has Cry1AC, this has got cry 2 ab genes, so it has two genes, and this one construct, I bombard it with a plant. I try to insert it into a plant, and when I insert it into a plant, I get a newly modified plant, right? Mm -hmm. okay. But you mm -hmm. need all these, all these things are going to stay on. These, this uh, border region, the promoter, the genes, and that is why you call it as genetically modified plant. It's very different from CRISPR, CRISPR, I'm not inserting like that. I'm actually modifying within, and I'm inserting a gene inside. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it doesn't leave any resident uh, sequences mm -hmm. to show that it is GMO. Mm -hmm. But whereas when you use this technology of taking my construct and bombarding into a plant, and the green thing that I showed down, plant genome green, it is at that location that this gene goes and gets inserted. And so you see how the gene, there's a break, just like in CRISPR, there's a break, I add. So there's a break and I add all these sequences in and that is why this 
modified thing that I have here is patentable subject matter. So when I show here that I have, I can't see it there. So this whole thing where I put a construct into a plant, such a plant never existed and such a construct never existed. Therefore, a method of transforming a plant using that construct is patentable. The construct per se is patentable, but my plant is not patentable because 3J says plants and animals are not patentable, correct? A method of making a transformed plant is patentable. A method of regenerating a plant is not patentable. So plants and animals are not patentable. So I get patent up to this step, right up till here, I get. But the plant one, I don't get. So what happens? My technology lies in the plant, right? If you take something like an iPhone, the technology lies here. It's like a chip. A chip is inside the iPhone, right? And the chip is the one maybe giving you memory. You have a camera here, and somebody would come up with a better camera, uh, and the camera could be used in any other devices, right? So ours is also a chip. The chip is this CRY2AB gene, which then goes into the plant. But India does not allow claims for a plant. So you can get a claim for a phone, a phone comprising the camera, a phone comprising the chip. My whole invention is on the chip. But I can get a device having the chip, right? I may not claim it, but I have it. So whenever you go to courts or you go to anybody and you say, my technology is on a chip, right? But you never buy a chip. Do you buy a chip? No, you buy always the phone. And you go for infringement and they say, does your phone have that chip? Oh, it has standard essential patterns. It has, and therefore you're infringing. They never go and look for, do you have a claim which says that you should have iPhone so-and-so or a Samsung phone having this thing. Such a claim is never there. But every time you go to a court, they understand that your claim is on a chip. The minute the chip is in a device, then they say you are infringing. Clear? But the same understanding, we don't have it in uh, biotech and we don't have it in, uh, in plants. I'm going to tell you in monoclonal antibodies a minute, but why do we have this? Because we say plants and animals are not patentable, right? So the minute I put a chip in a plant, because you don't have a claim for a plant, so I can infringe on the plant, right? What is the second difference? I have a chip in a phone, right? Can it multiply? Can it self-replicate? So I need to have a, I need to have a factory, I need to get this chip, and then I assemble it, correct? So you may be buying the chip, and the minute you buy the chip, you're also infringing, correct? Infringement type of things. But what happens in a plant? What happens in a microbe? Every time you make dahi, you're actually replicating the lactobacilli, correct? Every time you buy a plant, and if it's a rose, you will go by cutting, 